the litany of the most precious blood of Jesus on EWTN. EWTN. Live truth. Live Catholic. in Birmingham, of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about, family. We're going to talk about Jesus. Tonight, I think I owe an apology to somebody who wrote to me the other day, and I've answered your letter, because I was so disheartened by it. But I have a feeling that my brother's in the same boat, and so I just thought before I begin, whatever we're going to begin, that I would address it. A, um, a woman wrote to me and said her brother, her sister-in-law and herself um, decided after watching the network that they wanted to be Catholic. And so all three of them went to a pastor and entered the RICA, I think that's what you call it, or ICIA, what is it? Whatever it is, they went. <laughs> and the priest said, oh, why you want to bother? And they went two or three weeks, and some of the things he said were to them outreach, some morality, on God on the Eucharist, which they began to believe in by watching the network. For the women who wrote, and those of you who have made the head the same experience have never written to me, I apologize in the name of the Lord for the lukewarmness, the indifference, and the coldness of this young priest. And whoever has done this to you, you do not go through the gate, as our Lord said, <clears throat> and you don't allow anyone else to go through the gate. When they've tried to get in touch with him, <clears throat> he looked at his watch one day and he said, well, I have a golf game. Do whatever your conscience tells you. What a terrible thing. That the Spirit leads someone to the Eucharist, to the church, and all its wondrous doctrines. And a shepherd says, I don't have time. Follow your conscience. If there are any of you out there, I want to tell you what I wrote to this woman. Don't be discouraged. I'm sorry you cannot find a church that is teaching you the truth. I think there are in your city some churches that teach the real doctrine of the Catholic Church, the Eucharist, one Holy Communion is worth the search, is worth the effort, is worth the pain. 
is worth the disappointment. It is worth the heartache. That's how your letter began. It said, Dear Mother Angelica, <clears throat> I'm heartsick. Dear friend, so am I. So be courageous. Don't give up. Search and you shall find. Seek and knock until you find a zealous priest who welcomes you with open arms and teaches you the wonders of the revelations of Jesus, the Father and the Spirit. It's worth the effort. So I had to get that off my mind. I feel kind of responsible almost, you know. The network leads you to this wondrous dis decision and then Somebody comes and crushes it. Woe to the man. Many woes to the man who does such a thing. Pray for him. And ask the Lord to give him light. Deliver him from the obsession of the world. The lack of courage and truth. Your prayers for him will touch the heart of God because you forgive an enemy who tried to lead you away from the kingdom. That kind of forgiveness has to merit a great grace for the person who was so cold. I encourage you to please do that. We're all going to say a prayer for that priest and all those in the world, in the country, both ministers and priests and sisters who say such a thing. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and it is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, now of our death, amen. I think tonight we ought to talk a little bit about integrity and molding a character of a Christian. <clears throat> and what is integrity? Well, <clears throat> integrity is honesty, clarity of mind, and single-mindedness, I think. <clears throat> it is to be without guile. Integrity is something that's almost a lost virtue. Kids cheat in school. Uh, you never really believe a politician. <laughs> See? You don't believe in politicians, do you? You listen to their speeches. And you listen to these debates just because you want to see which one's the best. But many times you don't listen because you're almost sure they're not going to have any the slightest idea they're going to do what they say they're going to do. <clears throat> That's not the fault of politics. I think it's just a habit people get into. So we have a terrible lack of integrity. And why? Well, if you don't develop a Christian conscience and a Christian mind and a Christian heart, how are you going to be all these wonderful things that Christianity is supposed to be? And that's why in the American church today, not the church in America, but the American church, is so screwy. There's not that integrity that you can say, I believe what you say. You can't. Integrity <clears throat> is never to be deceitful or hypocritical. What's integrity? St. Peter says that, the first epistle. Well, a high school student, an honor student, was told today that in a 10 years or so, five years or so, the religion will not be taught. It will be the cosmic God. Three cheers for your honors. 
the cosmic God. As is deceit, there's no integrity there, there's no honesty, there's no truth, you see? Now, <clears throat> St. Peter says, <clears throat> you are newborn and like babies, you should be hungry for nothing. Have spiritual honesty. Oh, wow. Which will help you to grow up to salvation. Spiritual honesty. Well, and for me to be uh, spiritually honest, I have to know the truth, don't I? Hmm? I have to seek the truth. Otherwise, I'm ignorant. And then I believe whatever's put before me. You know, St. Peter says, St. Paul says, we have, we have itching ears. We want to hear what we want to hear. We go to confession and we go to a priest who believes in birth control and then we go to confession. We come out smelling like a rose, but you stink in the eyes of God. You're not smelling like a rose at all. We're always doing things so that I get exactly what I want. And that's the problem. See, <clears throat> St. Peter says again in the fourth chapter, think of what Christ suffered in this life and arm yourselves with the same resolution he had. That's an honesty. Anyone who in this life has bodily suffering has broken with sin. Wow. All you people suffering so much out there. He says you're broken with sin. I wonder what that means. Do you know what that means? Well, just say you had cirrhosis of the liver because you drank a quart of booze a day. And now you got cirrhosis of the liver, you can't drink, can you? Huh? That stopped you. I'm not too sure that's all it means. But many times our illnesses have kept us from a life of sin. In fact, in the life of Padre Pio, his nephew was blind. Was blinded at an early age. And someone said to Padre Pio, why don't you heal your nephew? You heal so many other people. He said, no. If I heal him, he will lose his soul. Did that mean every illness is a punishment? Oh, no. I hope not. Boy, am I in trouble. You know? <laughs> I'm in lots of trouble. It's a blessing. That's what it says here. We have to have the same. What was the resolution of Jesus? To suffer for souls. To suffer for our redemption. And St. Paul says we live in a wicked generation. And your lives should redeem it. Oh, wow. Our Lord already redeemed us, right? But my life has to be as sacrificial as the life of Jesus. What I do, I must do for God and for you. For everything we do, you see, has a benefit for others. It's something that we do, <clears throat> whether I have to suffer, whether you're lonely, whether you, you've lost everyone, you're living all by yourself, and, and, and whether whatever suffering you have can be beneficial to the kingdom of God for poor sinners. You know, I heard a story the other day one of our priests gave this sermon with the bishop. I think it was Bishop Vaughn the other morning. And he said, this, these two nuns and their mother were praying for their brother. And he murdered someone and was up for an electric chair. And that was not their idea of an answer to prayer. And he wouldn't see a priest. So this priest went to see him. And finally, I think it was just a, a, a day or so before his execution, he was, became t very repentant, sincerely repentant. Received the sacraments, confession, communion. He was anointed. Sorry for what he'd done. Isn't that strange? You know, you had to kind of think. 
that even though God allowed the very worst to happen to that young man, that very worst was still, at that point, an occasion for salvation. So the mother and the two sisters' prayers were answered, not in the way they thought, but they were answered. The very thing they fought against, somehow God used to save his soul. And though sometimes our sufferings, and part of our Christian character is to have that courage in times of, of suffering, in times of pain, in times of misunderstanding, in times of slander, All these times in your life, times when you have trouble with your children, all of these things that are painful and, and cause anxiety, all these are, are occasions to do this, to have the same resolution Jesus had in all his pain and all his suffering. He had one thing in mind, to redeem you and me, to give us that opportunity to have the divine indwelling and, and to have called God my Father. And you see, once we can break with, with sin, then we're free to search and to seek for God. Once all that attachment to myself, to others, to things, to the world, is gone, at that point, I'm free. I'm free to love God. I'm free to study. I'm free to know. I'm free to love. I'm free to do because he said the rest of the life on earth is not ruled by human passions, but only by the will of God. If I know what I'm suffering is either permitted or ordained by God, if my faith leads to hope, so that I, I do not despair in my pain and sufferings, then I am not controlled by my passions. I'm not controlled by my feelings. I'm not controlled by, by sadness. I, I am in the will of God. And, and you see, this is a part of building Christian character. It takes a lot of strength to do that. If we look over here and, and we, we realize that when we build character, we look at everything as part of the goodness of God. So I can afford by build. How do I build my character? I must praise the Lord for whatever happens to me, good, bad, indifferent. You know, something happened right on near our property, not just a, a week or so ago. And, and I, I just wanted to tell you about this hidden character, strong character in someone I understood, understand, is part, was partially retarded. Somebody got her, tried to rape her, and she fought so hard. She was stabbed to death thrown not about a yard away from our property back here. But the coroner said she was never raped. She fought that hard. A retarded young girl fought that hard. She just met your communion a year ago, was going to be back, was going to be confirmed in a few months. Nobody will know. If to those who hear my voice tonight, that that girl is just as much a martyr as St. Marie Goretti. Because she had the same thing. She fought against the rapist. She was stabbed 40 some times. And she died, forgiving him. And I thought, how many martyrs do we have today? That's character. Who is to say she was retarded? I don't think she's retarded at all, do you? No. I think she had it all together. Unbelievable. Her name was Stephanie. 
I started praying to her. I thought, she's got it. She has it all together. That's care. See, nobody knew she had that kind of character. Everybody looked at her as well, kind of pitiful, you know. She's retarded, she can't learn, but she had a job. But see, there was a, a character about that child that nobody even saw. But when the time came, it came out. That's integrity, honesty in what I believe, and I fight to keep it. Strength and strong in pain, in suffering, trusting in the Lord in confusion, trusting in his providence when things go wrong, ever keeping your faith high, your hope burning high, and your love never quenched by hatred or disappointment or the injustices of others. That's a Christian character that you and I have to develop. We have a call. Hello? Hey, Mama Angelica. Where are you from? From Barryville, Rhode Island. And what is your question? Uh, I don't have a question. First of all, uh, I really love your program. Thank you. I missed you last week. Uh, and uh, one of the weeks you were talking about being angry about something. Me? Uh, not you being oh. angry. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> If somebody was angry, and I'm, yeah, angry, yeah. I'm angry this week, sister. Oh, what's Mother the matter? Rather. Well, I've had all kinds of surgery. I've had uh, knee surgery. I've had lens implants. I've had laser treatment surgery. I've had open heart surgery. Ooh. And I need another oh, total knee done. And today I just found out that I have to have the lens implant that I had eight weeks ago. I have to have that taken out and then possibly have a corneal trans, uh, transplant. And when I found this out today, I was quite upset. But after listening to you tonight, and you keep saying how we should be blessed with our suffering, yeah. uh, it's, it's so hard. But, boy, I feel like I'm cheated sometimes, but I know I'm not. No. I know I'm not. But, I, you know, I'm just asking for prayers, and I just really want to tell you how good your program is. Well, will you, will you offer some of that for a, a special intention for me? I certainly will. Mother. Well, you, I would appreciate that because at this time in your life, even though there's a struggle, you know, I'm going to understand. You remember the time he said to the, which he said, who does the will of God? He said, well, there was a man, he had two sons, and he said, go to my farm. And the one son said, yeah, I'll go, but he never went. And then another son said, no, I'm not going to go. I don't want to go. And he felt kind of bad, so then he went. And the Lord said, who did the will of the Father? Well, it wasn't very hard to figure out the one who went. Well, he balked and he fussed and he fumed, but he went. Well, don't worry about it. And I had, I've had, let's see, seven, eight, nine operations myself. And I didn't like any of them. But it's all up there. You see, that's the wonderful part about it. It's nothing about pain is ever lost. Nothing in our life is lost. It's all waiting in that wondrous place we call heaven. See, everything in life is worth it if you keep your mind on heaven. How many times? I'm going to ask a question. By golly, I know exactly what's going to happen to. <laughs> How many times have you heard a sermon on heaven? Woo, just exactly what I thought. Now, isn't that a strange phenomena? That that's why I was born, that's why I was created, that's why I'm here, and nobody has ever talked to me about where I'm going? Somebody have told, a lot of people told me where to go, but... <laughs> I mean, a few talk, people tell me where to go, too. <laughs> but you see, that, that's what's so important. You can't have courage, you can't build a character if you don't have a, the reality that I'm on my way. I don't have here a lasting city. I'm on my way. I had a wonderful experience the other night, the other morning. Um, I was in bed, 
and um, I've been sleeping in because I got this bronchitis and everything, and my room was very dark, and you know, when I was a young sister, I used to lean on the windowsill in my bedroom as a young sister, uh, trying to watch the dawn, trying to watch it get light. And I'd sit there like that, and I'd just stand there, and I'd look at that. I never could see it get light. It, it got light, but I couldn't see it happen. Did you ever try that? Huh? And that bug you? <clears throat> I could never, <clears throat> I could never see it happen. And, and um, well, and I forgot about it. I thought, well, you know, sometimes you ask God for things and you're just wasting your time with it because you can't have it. You can't see it. And so for years now, I have not leaned out the window or the windowsill or even thought about seeing that instant when something goes on and there's light. Now, don't tell me about the sun and the world and all that stuff. I want to know when it got light, you know? <clears throat> so I had lying there in bed, and I was awake. And I had the most awesome experience of my whole life. I saw the dawn. It was awesome. I don't think I'll ever forget it. I saw that instant when it went from darkness to light. I was so excited, I didn't know what to do. And it was an instant. It wasn't even a second. It was a, a part, maybe a part of a second. But suddenly my room was lit up, not with a bright sun, but I could see from that total darkness, I could see the, the wall, my cabinet, my bed. And I knew I saw the dawn. And you know what, God? I, I was telling the sisters a lesson. And what dawned on me, that's at conception. An instant quicker than my, my fingers could snap, you became. And I thought, that's the way death must be. Maybe you're in pain, you're in suffering, you've had a rotten life all your life and nothing ever seemed to go wrong. You're a born loser. But there's going to come a moment, a wondrous moment, an instant, just like that light that you're going to see him face to face. And everything else is going to be gone. Gone forever. Pain, suffering, misunderstanding, the whole bit. And then I thought of the darkness in the church today. Awesome darkness. And somehow, At some time, there will be that instant, and we'll see the dawn, a new light, a new church, a new vibrancy. <coughs> it's going to happen. God has not abandoned us. But I have to know that after that instant of sight, when I see God, just as quick as I saw the dawn. It's such a said this morning to me, did you see the dawn again, brother? I said, no. <laughs> no, I didn't. I even watched for it, but I didn't see anything. Not a thing. It just got light. Heaven. Struggling, as it says here in Galatians, to have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and trustfulness, gentleness and self-control, all these things mold the character. And without him, my character gets <coughs> dissipated and weak, confused, anxious. 
You can't get around it. You can't get around it. And it's worth it all. You see, that's the beauty of it. If I think of that one instant that I shall see him face to face. And after that, a happiness you and I cannot even believe. A joy, a beauty, a voice, a knowledge, understanding. I will not only know how much I am loved by God, but I will be loved by everybody there. I mean, you're not loved by everybody. Are you loved by everybody? No, you're not loved by everybody. That's a joke here on this earth. But there, there in heaven, I and you will, will love each other in the same way God loves us. Can you imagine it? Even that pill you lived with that you didn't love. <laughs> You're going to love him there. See? The person who caused you the most trouble, if he was repented, you're going to love him there. And if you refuse, you won't be there. See? We have a phone call. Is that what you're trying to tell me, sweetheart? You are. Thank you. Hello? Hello. Hello. I'm from Pennsylvania. You're from Pennsylvania? Uh-huh. Okay, what's your question? My teacher from school said that there is no pur purgatory. I didn't hear it, did you? My teacher from school said there was no purgatory. Okay, you want me to explain it to you? Yeah. How old are you? Eight. You're eight. You know, we have a wonderful young audience. Last week, we had the most intelligent questions from two eight-year-olds and one nine. And now we got a whopper. But it's not hard to see. <clears throat> The whole essence, sweetheart, of, of our living is that in the struggle of life, in the struggle against our own faults, weaknesses, and sins, we overcome and become like Jesus. That's the power of grace, that part of God in me. And, and when I cooperate with God, then that image of me that is not so good, you know, becomes brighter and brighter, becomes more like Jesus. And as it becomes more like Jesus, then I, I love. I'm kinder. I'm more compassionate, more patient, more understanding, more filled with self-control. So when I die then, when I look at him and he looks at me, we look alike. Isn't that great? We're looking alike. And, and that's, what, that's when I run into the arms of Jesus. Because we look alike. We think alike. We acted alike. We loved alike. We forgave alike. We had mercy alike. But say, I did not always forgive. I did not always love. I was not always patient. There were some people I disliked, maybe hated, couldn't stand around. And then I see all this wondrous beauty and love and compassion and all. See, we don't look alike, do we? Huh? We don't look alike. But at the moment I see that beautiful face of Jesus and understand his love and compassion all of the, and understand how much he loved me all my life, but I can't go. There's, there's like my feet are stuck because I don't look alike. I want to look alike, but I don't. That's purgatory. I want so much to be with him, but I can't because I, I got all these things in me. See, that's what purgatory is. That's not hard to understand, is it? Huh? 
that hard to understand? No. Now, if I have at some point arrived at such an evil life that I have hated him, then when I see that infinite love, I shall recoil. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull back because I can't stand the sight of it, and I turn away, and that's hell. See? Do you understand? It's very simple. We put ourselves in hell, and we put ourselves in purgatory. He merely stands there and loves us. What I'm saying, I think, is be a lookalike with Jesus. We have another call. Hello? Hello, sister. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Chicago, Illinois. And Thank you for accepting my call. And what is, your, what is your question? Sister, I lost my mother four months ago tomorrow. And um, it seems to me that the subject of losing your mother, especially your mother, is not spoken about as much as it should be. Uh, I've, I'm going through this pain that I think it's, it's the greatest pain anybody could feel. And I, I want to know, you know, what do you think about this? I'm, I, I'm sorry I never said, I love you. She passed away suddenly. I never thanked her for being my mother. Give me some advice, sister. Um, were you, were, did, you, did you have a quarrel with her or something? No, no. No? Uh, no, it's just that it happened suddenly. But you, you, you loved her when she was living? Oh, yes. We were very close. Well, <clears throat> I think everybody feels that. Uh, my mother was sick 13 years, and um, I did as much as I could for her. But I don't care how much you do. I don't know what it is, it's just part of our nature, I think, that we, we wonder why we didn't do this little thing and why I didn't answer more quickly when she called. But I, I would put that aside. If you could see your mother now, she has seen the face of Jesus. If she's in heaven, she wants you to forget all that. She wants you to know she forgives, she loves you, and she wants you to go on. Don't, don't, don't ever yield to regret. Don't yield to regret because you loved your mother and all these little things that you didn't do or didn't say thank you, didn't say I love you enough. Um, if she, if she felt that, but I, from the way you're talking, I think you loved your mother. But I think it's a part of us that we just, it's a part of grieving. But you know what I would do? I would go <clears throat> before the Blessed Sacrament, if you can find a church open, or just kneel in your room. <clears throat> And tell her everything you want to tell her. I love you. I'm grateful. I'm grateful you're my mother. Just tell her the whole thing. And then she's heard it. Forget it now. It's finished. She hears you. She knows. So don't, don't spend now the rest of your life in some kind of grief. There is an emptiness, I think, that was going to go with time. And, and I think that's a part of the suffering and purification we all have to, have to go through. And that's good. It means you loved her much. And, and we'll pray for her. We have another call. Hello? <clears throat> Hi, Mother Angelica. Where are you from? I'm from New England. And what is your question? Well, it's more of a statement than a question, I guess, or it's a statement of confusion. Um, I've been married 23, 22 years, and I have three children, and my husband committed adultery 25 months ago. Mm -hmm. And when I confronted him, I went and prayed for quite a long time and just said, Lord, I'm going to move my lips. You make the words come out. And I forgave him for 
put my arms around him, told him I loved him, and we would work it through. And I've been praying and forgiving ever since. Um, I'm an at-home mother, so I pray roughly six hours a day, sitting still, and then constantly when I'm on the go. But I went to talk to a priest four months into this situation, and he said to me, the marriage is over, pull the plug. And I thought to myself at the time, if he had a terminal illness and I threw him out, I would be terrible. This man has a cancer of the spirit far worse than any physical illness. Yeah. I can't do that. I spoke recently to another priest. Now it's 25 months later. And I have to be honest, I'm real get, really getting tired. And he said to me, well, divorce is only civil. Well, tongue-in-cheek, in this day and age, divorce is anything but civil. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's it, I don't know, it's just a, <coughs> such a cavalier <coughs> approach. <coughs> and when I tell, you know, people that I pray, that I trust in God, that my husband is a good man who's made a terrible mistake, <coughs> and that God loves him and he made him. And I wonder, though, sweetheart, what these people think of who these priests or whoever they are that advise you, <coughs> what they thought of our dear Lord when the law said to this woman said, who committed adultery, and there was a man involved. You have to have two, don't you? Am I naive about this thing? No? I'm not naive? Okay. <laughs> Since I'm not naive about this thing, there's a man involved, and I never did find out what happened to this guy. <clears throat> However, the reality of our dear Lord's answer to her is no one condemned thee, Lord. She said, no one, Lord. And her, and she, she said, neither will I. Go and sin no more. See, people fail, and, and I, I think it must be terribly hard for men when everywhere they look, there's a naked woman. My God. We talk about women's liberation and womenness and women that, and never in the history of the world has women been so degraded on television. Never, never have they been so degraded. You get the impression that every woman is a prostitute, a hooker, or a call girl. And, and don't yield to, to thoughts of, of divorce and be forgiving, 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 forgiving. Pray. <clears throat> Pray hard. Family life is torn apart today everywhere. Because as soon as things get hard, everybody wants to get out. You can't. Pray and pray, and pray, and forgive. You will never, never be sorry. We have another call. Hello? Um, hello, Mother Angelica? Yeah, where are you from? I'm from um, uh, in the Dallas, Texas area. Mm -hmm. um, Mother, you talked earlier. First of all, we thank you so much for um, um, the wonderful things you do on EWTN, and we're real grateful to have you in our home and, and in all the homes in the United States, and we wish you well and God bless. I have a two-fold question for you, Mother. I have a son who I'm homeschooling that's um, eight years old, and I just found out through talking to my son when we were teaching his um, the, um, eighth com or the Sixth Commandment about not committing adultery that he was sodomized by a little boy one year ago that was 13 years old, and he was seven. Mm -hmm. Now... My mother says that I'm to, t to look at that and I'm supposed to um, forgive and go on. And just previously, about 20 minutes ago on your program, you were talking about how character, how God expects us to have character, character to rise above. Mm -hmm. My question is, I mean, where do you, I mean, even though you say the rosary and you say these prayers, you, you walk away after, you know, after seeing my son and he, he can't really deal with it. He's not emotionally hurt, I don't think. I think he's over it. but. 
by talking about the commandments at school, he ended up telling me this towards bedtime about he was afraid he was going to go to hell and whatnot. Well, how do you find the forgiveness? I mean, do you just let time go by and just keep telling and then every day it gets better? I've had some things happen to me, but never anything. Who, are, who are you talking of forgetting? The boy who, who the abused? The boy who did, the 13-year-old okay. who did this to my son. Okay. But also, how do you get past it? Because as a mom, you just want to scream and shout. And I know. Well, have, have you done something about the boy with his parents and told them? Well, we told the parents, and we're trying to have the parents seek counseling for him. Right. We talked to well, that, Honey, that is the most wonderful Christian thing you could ever do. And, and I, I think all parents today, especially when they begin sixth sex education in third, fourth, fifth grade, what in the world do you expect these kids to do? When you start sex education in second, third, fourth, fifth grade, my God, they don't go to school. Today. How long does it take to know the facts of life? You know, we're pounding it, pounding it, pounding in these kids' heads, and no wonder these kids are going crazy, sex crazy, at early ages. Why don't we teach them about God? Let them know there is such a thing as sin. And you see, the result of your child is, is, is part of this. It's everywhere, sweetheart. you got to be, and you are, careful. And, and love your son. And, and, and tell them to be honest with you and tell them what's wrong, but in such a way that he understands that purity and chastity are so wonderful and that he is not guilty of anything. There's where you have to come. How do you forgive? You forgive by saying it. It's very hard to forgive and not remember. I don't think God expects us to have spiritual amnesia. Things come back and just forgive again. Love your son. Make him know he is so loved by God. We had that same thing a couple of weeks ago with a six-year-old. She had to go to court and had a terrible thing. Huh? It tells you the whole lack of integrity and honesty and goodness in the whole world. When Catholic schools ceased to be taught by nuns who were sincere and holy and drove for holiness of life, society went right down the tube. Because our children are not being taught the things they should be taught. I would be careful, number one, what your son is taught. And I would, I would encourage him also to forgive. And it's a blessing from God and the fruit of your prayers that he is not emotionally damaged. And we'll pray. It's, it's something that's going on everywhere, every day. I hope we never take it for granted. Pray and continue to forgive. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. I'm calling from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I understand what you're saying about suffering, and I've heard this many times in my life. My question is, I think I can handle the suffering going on in my life if I knew that when I died I could be with Jesus. Yeah. What I'm having a hard time with is many of us know we will have to go to purgatory, and the thought of having to go through more suffering after this life is very difficult. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions how to keep one's hope up? Well, <clears throat> I, mother, I, I, would, I, I would disagree with your first statement. I don't think you have to go to purgatory. I really don't. Um, I expect to make a little detour myself, but... <laughs> <laughs> But it's because to whom much is given, much is required. And to those who have been given much on trust, even more is required in St. Luke's Gospel. But I would not fear purgatory because that is a lack of pure love for Jesus. And it's not the same kind of suffering. There is in purgatory, contrary to a lot of books you read, a great joy. 
You have seen him face to face, and you know you made it. <laughs> yeah, you made it. <laughs> Can you beat that? You know you made it. Well, we may have to suffer something. It's not the same kind, though. I, I wouldn't dwell on it. Um, just love Jesus for himself. Thank him for all he does for you. Um, try to do his will the best way you can with love, even though you don't understand what's going on. That's okay. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about purgatory. The essence of holiness is very simple. The essence of holiness is to love as God loves and to do his will. Prayer is an, a means to that end. Goodness is a means to that end. Virtue is a means to that end. The sacraments are a means to that end. If you do not receive his body, blood, soul, and divinity, he said you don't have life in you. Well, the life is grace. And, and I need that to be all these wonderful things that's in Galatians, that fifth chapter. See? So if you do all that, don't even think of purgatory. We don't want to aim for purgatory. You know, you're, you're aiming for heaven. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't take for granted you're going to purgatory because if you love God with a sincere heart and you accept the trials of the present moment with love, I think it'd be very short. I think they'd be very short. And I... The mercy of the Lord is so great, so great, that we cannot conceive. If we were able, after we get to heaven, to kick ourselves all around the kingdom, we would do that once we realized how easy it was to be a saint. I really think that way. How easy it would have been to be a saint. Be one. This is what God is, expects from us. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit, he says. And he says, when you know that, then you will keep that temple clean. I love you. God loves you a lot. Bye now. this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store. Log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week or call 1-800-854-6316. 
Doug Keck inviting you to join me next time when we speak with Professor O. Carter Sneed about his book, What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics. A lot of people have a kind of impressionistic understanding of what bioethics is. It's uh, the sort of the ethical discourse relating to advances in biomedical science and biotechnology and the practice of medicine. Public bioethics is where the law and public policy come into contact with those questions. Next time on Book. Enrich your Lenten journey with powerful weekly meditations from the Slipper Chapel in the Basilica of Our Lady of Walsingham. This week, Father Pius Collins reminds us to forgive others. Sin not only distances us from God, but from ourselves and from our own humanity. The mercy and forgiveness offered to us is offered to all men and women if they will repent. Lenten Reflections, here on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. Dio onnipotente e misericordioso, guarda la nostra dolorosa condizione, conforta i tuoi figli e apri i nostri cuori alla speranza, perché sentiamo in mezzo a noi la tua presenza di Padre, per Cristo il nostro Signore. Discover outstanding holy reminders anytime. Go to EWTNRC.com to watch the latest episode of EWTN Religious Catalog right on the homepage. Learn about the newest sacramentals, books, and gifts for any season from the EWTN family you know and love. Buy Catholic. Shop the EWTN Religious Catalog on EWTNRC.com. There's nothing under the sun or about the sun we don't talk about. Every day of the week, EWTN Catholic personalities and experts proclaim and explain the truth that is the eternal word. From challenges at home to issues that are universal, cutting through the clutter to reveal the beauty and mystery of our faith so you can grow closer to Christ and His church. The journey home, at home with Jim and Joy, Scripture and Tradition, called to Communion, Father Spitzer's Universe, EWTN Live, Life on the Rock, Women of Grace. Go to EWTN for program schedules or watch anytime on demand. EWTN, live truth, live Catholic. I am not seeking my own will, but the will of him who sent me. My trouble is that I often seek my own will instead of yours, Lord. I pray today for the grace to seek your will in everything. Join the queue to your left. The doctor will assess you for any diseases. If you pass the medical, you'll be allowed into the country. Thank you. Next. Names? Sean Gallagher, sir. And you are Roshin Gallagher? Your daughter, Mary? She didn't make it so. <laughs> Don't worry about the paperwork. There's some bread and water over there. Get that first. 
and then you can come and collect the documents. God bless now. Spike Aiden.